Good morning, fourth grade students. This is Jason Brown with Boone County 4-H coming to you with a life cycle of the honeybee lesson. We're going to talk today about honeybees, how they reproduce, the different types of honeybees. We're going to talk about the thing that you're probably most excited about, which is how they produce honey. And if you're like me, you love honey. It's a great tasting natural product. And in some ways, it has some health benefits that can really help us. So we're going to dive in. We're going to talk about honeybees this morning. To start off, though, we won't talk a lot about it. Obviously, bees are a natural part of our world. And in most cases, bees are wild as far as their colonies. And you see in the picture here some wild honeybees there. Uh, these are actually the two pictures here. Is one is up under a, a shed or a building. And then the other in the bottom is up under or inside a house. But bees mostly are wild. It's just that the ones that I think we're most familiar with are the ones that are taken care of by a beekeeper. And so they're going to be in the boxes. Wild bee colonies, like you see in the pictures here, they can get as large as 50 to even 100,000 bees because there are no restrictions like there would be in a, a box that the beekeeper has. And so they can just continue to grow and reproduce indefinitely as long as there's room for them to do so. Let's start by identifying the three types of honeybee. The first there on the far left is going to be the worker bee. The worker bees are all female bees, and they literally do all the work. They take care of the hive in the sense of they guard the hive, they scout for food, they go out and gather the nectar as the food, bring it back, they process it to the point that it becomes honey, uh, they take care of the brood, which is where the young or the larvae are at, they feed and take care of the queen, they clean the, the hive out, they do all the work. A female worker bee's lifespan is only about four to six weeks as they literally will work themselves to death. And so they really don't have a very long lifespan, uh, but their job, and they do it well, is to take care of everything. Now, when it comes to seeing bees out in nature, 99% of the time, because they're so numerous and they are the only ones that typically leave the hive for any great length of time, if you see honeybees out in nature, it's very likely that that is a worker bee. If you go over to the next one, the drones. The drones are all male. Now, one thing I forgot to say about the worker bee, to, to jump back real quick, is they do have a stinger. And as you've probably known from the maybe past experience even, if you get stung by a worker bee, they'll actually will die. That's a part of their natural process is they, they'll sting and when they pull away, the stinger actually pulls out and it actually, in a sense, disembowels them. Sounds kind of gross, I know, but that's what happens to them. Have a stinger, they can only sting once and that's it and then they die. I say that because when you go to the drone, the drone doesn't have a stinger. They can't sting, there's no defense in that area. And their sole job as a male drone is to mate if it's needed. Say a, a new queen is hatched out and born, she has to be, uh, she'll mate with one of the drones and then she'll be able to go and start laying eggs. Pretty useless in a sense if that's their only job and they only get to do it ever so often. Come winter, these useless feeders, these drones who aren't probably going to be needed, oftentimes the worker bees to conserve food will kick the drones out of the hive and let them freeze to death and die because they don't want them taking up space and eating food when they really only have one purpose. Well, let's go to the queen. The queen is the largest, obviously. She will live about three to five years. Average is how long they'll live. She's got about a three to five year lifespan. All she does is lay eggs. That's her job, lay eggs. And to keep the hive going, she'll lay approximately 1,500 eggs a day. It seems like a lot, and it is a lot. But if you think about it, if every month through the cycle, you have thousands of worker bees that are dying of exhaustion because they've worked for the hive and its benefit, she needs to be producing a lot of offspring every day so that, in turn, they can replace those who, who die. It's a process where she's laying a lot because a lot of them are dying, and this is about survival for the colony. So she has to work really, really hard to make sure she's reproducing there. She doesn't even stop to go to the restroom. She doesn't even stop to eat. All that process is taken care of by the worker bees. Honeybee, four stages of their life cycle, and you can kind of see the picture there at the top to the right kind of clearly lays it out. If you look to the left, what will happen is the queen will lay an egg in the little honeycomb wax cell. 
Now the eggs, now all three will be an egg for about three days. And after that time, they'll hatch and they will be, they'll begin to receive nutrients from the worker bees. For the first like six days of their hatched out life, they will receive a substance called royal jelly. That is a substance that is excreted from the head of the honeybee, the worker bee. There's glands in their head that secretes this nutrient. Sounds kind of gross, but it's actually highly concentrated, very beneficial for them. Matter of fact, it's so potent and helps them grow so rapidly that once the larva has hatched, in the first day, they'll grow five times their size. And then after six days, they will have grown 1,500 times their size. And so that kind of gives you an indication of how important that nutrient is and how beneficial it is. After that time period, the worker bee and the drones, they'll be switched over to what's called bee bread. That's a mixture of pollen and honey. And they will eat that until they develop enough where they'll be enclosed in a cocoon and they'll go through that final metamorphic process. If you look at the picture there, you notice how the worker bee is putting a wax cap on top. They'll actually put a cap on, and based on what the cap looks like, they'll know what's inside that particular cell. So if it's a flat cap, they know it's a worker bee. If it's a rounded cap, they'll know it's a drone. We'll look here in a second about what the cell looks like if they're trying to produce a queen. But after a certain period of time, they will then go through that metamorphic process and they will begin to chew their way out and emerge as an adult bee. If they are a worker bee, they'll actually come out and they'll go and they'll eat because they haven't eaten in a while and they have a very high metabolism as far as energy use. They'll eat and then they'll come back and actually clean out the cell and get it ready for a new egg to be laid in there. So this chart breaks down how long they're in each stage. You look at the queen, three days as an egg. They're all obviously, as you can tell, three days they stay as an egg. And once they've hatched, they'll stay a, a larva for a certain time period, and then pupa. And then of course, after 16 days, the queen will emerge, 21 days for the worker bee, 24 days for the drone. The queen's process is a lot quicker for her to grow and emerge because she'll actually receive the royal jelly, that nutrient, her whole life cycle. And so that's part of the reason why her time is so short is that she's receiving this high concentration of that nutrient and it'll cause her to grow rapidly. And that's important because if this hive doesn't have a queen, they have to produce one very quickly. Second ago, we were talking about how the eggs are laid in the wax cells. And as we're going to see, eventually, we're going to see that the honey is produced in these wax cells. The question might be, where do they get this wax to produce these cells? And to be honest, for a long time, I thought they produced the wax from nature. They went out and found materials in nature that they could chew up and produce the wax. But the fact is that honeybee, the worker bees, they have glands in their abdomen. You can see it in the picture there that produce wax flakes. If it's needed, they will ingest the honey and that honey then will go through the process of going through their body and it will produce these wax flakes. And they take these wax flakes and chew it and form the comb that you've probably seen many times as far as the honeycomb and then they're able to put the brood in and they're able to put nectar in they'll eventually become honey. Here's a good picture, it shows the queen bee and you can really get a good sense of her size compared with the others. Remember, she does nothing but lay eggs all day and so the worker bees are taking care of her, cleaning her, feeding her, meeting all those needs. It's about survival and if thousands of worker bees tire out and die every day, she has to keep laying eggs to keep the numbers up so their hive does not go extinct. You will also note that this queen bee has a red dot on her back. Sometimes a beekeeper will mark the queen and because she's hard to see, she'll camouflage herself a lot of times. They'll mark her with a bright color so they know where she is and they can find her. They also do that because if the queen that they have present in the hive, say she dies or whatever happens to her, if they raise up a new queen and then the beekeeper looks later and finds the queen and there's no red dot on the back, then he knows that a change has happened. And that's kind of important so you know how the life cycle of your hive is going. In this video, we just I'm showing you this just so you can see a picture, a video of the bees working there. That top portion you see there, that's actually honeycomb. And then when you go down further, you're gonna notice that they are working on brood down below. 
This is a good picture. You can definitely see the queen laying eggs and you can see the little eggs. Remember, they're about the size of a grain of rice. But the next video you're going to see is from a YouTube channel, Barnyard Bees. And he actually will talk about and show you how the queen lays the eggs in that process. Watch her tail. She'll look, she'll inspect and see if there's anything in the... Then there she go. Did you see her? Right there. She'll check and see if there's anything in the cell. Right there, there's a good shot of her. Sticking her tail right down in there. Right there again. In this slide, you can see the different states of going through that gestation process, everything from eggs on up to larva. Some have already been capped in as they grow and go through that final metamorphic process there. Here you can see a cross section of the bees. These honeybees are in that pupa state where they've been capped in, closed in, they're going through that final metamorphic process. You can see there clearly that they're developing eyes, wings, legs, abdomen. All those things are starting to form and take shape. Briefly, this one, I want you to see this one because if you look at the top picture there, you can see a cross section of the different stages. So the one on the far right, that's a pupa that hasn't developed very much at all. All the way over to the far left, you see one that is more or less fully developed. You've got little hair follicles, you've got definite legs, antennae, eyes, those things are starting to form. So what happens if a hive needs to produce a new queen? It can happen. Sometimes the queen gets old and dies. Sometimes she gets sick and dies. Sometimes, and this is rare, but it can happen. Sometimes the hive just gets tired of her for whatever reason and gets rid of her. Or if the beekeeper introduces a new queen into the hive because they need a new queen and they don't like her, they'll sometimes kill her and raise up their own queen. Oftentimes what they'll do is they will raise up multiple queens because you want to make sure that you have enough in case something happens. Say you only try to raise up one queen, it takes 16 days for that to happen. If that one queen doesn't survive, then they're really hurting because then they go another 16 days and during that time, they are not producing offspring because she's not laying eggs. So they'll often try to produce, as you see in the pictures, more than one. The little cell that they develop in and go through their metamorphic uh, cycle is large, obviously, because the queen's going to be very large. Now, in a hive, there can only be one queen. The scenario can go like this. Say the first queen hatches out before the second queen there you see in the picture hatches. What can happen is sometimes that first queen will go over and sting through the second queen's enclosure to kill her because there can only be one queen and she's not going to allow her to have the chance to come out so that they fight it out. And so that can happen. Sometimes they hatch at the same time and they will fight to the death and the queen that lives will become the queen at that point. Sometimes they fight it out and it becomes a draw. And if that happens, oftentimes the one of the queens will take some of the hive and leave and go and form a new colony somewhere. So there's several scenarios that can happen with a queen, but it has to be done quickly because again, while they're not producing eggs and those eggs becoming worker bees, the hive is in danger. How do bees make honey? So we're gonna talk about it here. First and most importantly is that the worker bees will send out scouts. Scouts will go out and check out areas for which there are flowers and they can draw nectar from those flowers. So first and most importantly, Scouts are going to go out, they're going to look, they're going to find areas where there is food for them. Once the scouts have located a source of food, they'll then go back to the hive and they've got to be able to communicate where the food source is. Well, bees can't talk, obviously, and so they'll do what's called a bee waggle dance. You maybe have heard of this. This is where they dance in sort of a figure eight sort of shape and they'll vibrate their body. If you look at the picture there, the direction they're pointing and sort of as they do it is going to be uh, related to the proximity of the hive to the direction of the sun. So if the food source is straight ahead, you see that they'll do the dance that way. If the food source is at a 30 degree angle to the left, they'll do the dance in that direction. In this video, you actually see a bee doing a waggle dance. The vibration and then the quick sort of figure eight shape that they'll do. You can see that and then up close you can see that as well and kind of get an idea of what it looks like. At that point the 
Worker bees will go out and they will be guided based on the directions to the flowers so they can start gathering up the nectar. You notice this bee in this picture is covered in pollen and then there's pollen on the little pouches on the back of their legs. Don't forget, bees produce honey, but one of the biggest things they do is they're pollinators. They take pollen from plant to plant and that gives the ability for fruits, vegetables, those kind of things to happen because of pollination. And obviously one of the fears people have is the bee population is declining, pollination is not happening like it should be. Here's a picture briefly of the bees ingesting the nectar. This is a great picture, it's up close. You can see their little proboscis or their tubular tongue reaching out and sucking up that nectar. They'll draw that down into their stomachs and then they'll take it back to the hive. In this picture here, you see a great look at a bee. Now this is not a honey bee, but it is a good look at a bee gathering nectar off of the surface there, and you get a good look of sort of drawing it up, its little proboscis working. Once they've ingested as much nectar as they can, they'll have a little bit of pollen and the little pouches on the back of their legs, they'll go back to the hive, and they'll deposit the nectar from their stomachs, now mixed with some of the enzymes from their stomachs, into the little comb there. They'll flap or beat their wings, and that produces enough air. It will cause the nectar to evaporate as far as the water content in the nectar. And that's a part of the process of how we end up with honey being as thick as it is. So they'll actually cause some of the, the water in the nectar to evaporate by flapping their wings. That's really usually a group effort there on the comb for many different cells as they're working. The bee then obviously will go back out to, to draw more nectar and come back. And in a bee's lifetime, one worker bee's lifetime, they will only create about a teaspoon of honey for the whole hive. That's another reason why it takes 50,000 of them to keep the hive going because they their work is limited as far as how much they can carry and how long the process takes. Now it's time for the beekeeper to harvest some honey. So the beekeeper will put on an outfit like you see there in the picture. It's got a hood and it's got the full body outfit gloves. Some beekeepers don't fool with the outfits. Some beekeepers just put the hood on because they don't want to get stung in the face. I personally would probably wear the whole outfit simply because I've seen too many times where beekeepers get stung by multiple bees if the bees were to become angry or agitated. And that's not something that I want to deal with in the area of allergic reactions or anything like that that may take place. Now, I would personally recommend you wear the full outfit. Look at the bottom right there. The beekeeper has his hand on the smoker. The smoker is used with the little bellows to put smoke down inside the hive. And that is meant to distract the bees. Uh, there are several theories about why it is that the smoker works. One of them is that the smoke down there, the bees are more worried about the smoke and where it's coming from and what to do about it than they are this giant thing that just took the lid off the hive. So for whatever reason, they're kind of distracted. You can work with the hive a little bit easier without them becoming aggressive. So when it's time to start harvesting some honey, the beekeeper will pull some frames out of the hive. Smart beekeeper knows he can only take so much honey because he's got to leave some honey behind for the bees to be able to survive, especially if winter's coming up and the bees aren't as active. He'll look through the frames and begin to pull out the frames that he needs or he thinks he can take without harming the bees in the process. He's going to take a brush and brush the bees off of the frames. Obviously, you don't want to take them with you, so he's going to pull those off completely and take those frames back to his shop so he can extract the honey. Back at the shop, the beekeeper is going to cut off the caps because once the little comb is filled, they'll actually put a wax cap over it to keep it and preserve it. So the beekeeper is going to cut the wax off the caps there. You can see this one, this video, this guy's using a knife. You can do that. There are many different ways to do it. In this video, you can see the person is using a sort of a, I forget what they're called, but it almost looks like a fork to sort of pick the tops off of it. Either way, they're going to cut that off. Once you've cut off the caps off the honey on the frames, you're going to put the frames down into this big tub. It has a motor on top, and the object of this particular machine is when it's turned on, it will spin and throw the honey to the outside of the container to slide down and out the bottom. Or it goes faster and faster. So you can put down, see 
it's slinging on the edges. Oh wow, can you see that? That's pretty cool. Once that process is done, you're going to put a bucket down below and you're going to put a filter and a screen over top of it. Then you're going to open the valve and it's going to start pouring out. Now there's a screen there to catch some of the debris because in the honey is going to be wax bits. There's going to be dirt. There's going to be bits of bee parts, believe it or not. That kind of stuff's going to be in there. And so it will be filtered out. I do want to say that good honey is not overly filtered because if you filter it too much, then you actually end up removing some of the qualities from the honey that is beneficial to us. So you don't want to over filter and good beekeepers do not do so. At the very end, it's going to be jarred up. You're going to be able to buy it at the local farmer's market, maybe some other places. There are stores that do sell quality honey. I would say be careful where you buy your honey and what type it is. And in some places, like some of our big chain stores, the honey that you're buying is not honey at all. It's imitation honey, and you really have to be careful. There's a lot of honey coming from places like China, places like that where it's not real honey. It's actually syrup that's made from rice and other things. And so you do have to be careful. Make sure you get your honey from a place that is local and that doesn't over filter or heat up their honey during the process so that you can get the full benefit. Here at the end, I wanted to get you a couple of additional resources. I'll link these in the description below in the video, but how bees produce honey, it's a great video, and how beekeepers gather honey, both are really good. I highly recommend you checking them out. As I said at the beginning, I work for Boone County 4-H, and 4-H is a great program for you to get involved in. If you want to join 4-H, follow the link there to look for enrollment information. I'll post that in the bottom as well in the description. I'd love to have you join 4-H. We've got summer camp coming up and some other activities that I think that you would really enjoy. Again, my name is Jason Brown. Thank you for watching this video. If you would like more information about joining 4-H, just have your parents call me or email me. would love to talk to them a little bit more about what we can do and what 4-H has to offer. I hope that everybody is staying safe, having some fun, doing well. I hope that you're staying strong. I know this is another school year where things are a bit crazy. Hang in there and just keep doing your best. We'll talk to you all soon.